I got home uh, Tuesday night from Memphis. I preached there five times. And um, the Lord was incredibly ga- gracious to um, pour out his Holy Spirit on myself and the congregation. It was really something of God, and it was very timely. And I'm glad the pastor heard from God on the conference. Um, I was ecstatic. I was happy. He's a good friend of mine. It wasn't like I was going somewhere where I didn't know. I know him for 10 years now. Um, We're similar in a lot of ways. We get along great. And uh, we admire each other. And I was so happy. And I flew home Tuesday night, and I was so happy. And Wednesday, all day long, I was laughing. Just so happy. And then sundown came, and everything changed. I didn't want it to change. Just as soon as Yom Kippur kicked in, my whole countenance totally changed. It wasn't contrived. Um, I didn't think I needed it to change. It just did. And um, after my crew went to sleep and I spent a couple hours with the Lord last night, I received some things that um, you might not be crazy about hearing. Um, but then again, you know, Isaiah was sawn in two, and Amos was beaten with a club to death, and Zechariah was stoned right in the temple. So this is nothing new under the sun. Um, Ten days ago, on the first of Tishrei, which is the seventh month on God's biblical calendar, in the year 5,782, corresponding to September 7th, 2021, We here at Beth Yeshua celebrated Yom Teruah, which was a time of regathering and leading us to Yom Kippur, which is a time of repentance, which will eventually lead us to Sukkot, which is a time of revival. Um, Looking at Yom Kippur in the scriptures, we go to Leviticus 23, and we look at these verses from 26 to 32, and this is what it says. Adonai said to Moshe, now know this, when you see quotes... This is God speaking. There's a lot of times in the Bible where God is not speaking. Uh, If you read in the book of Ecclesiastes when Solomon is speaking, it's not anointed by no means. It's not the voice of God by no means. He's jaded, and it's not something you want to hold on to as truth. But when you see the Lord said to Moses, and there's a quote, that is his words, okay, infallible and irrefutable. It says the 10th day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur, which is today. You ought to have a holy convocation, which we are having. You ought to deny yourself, and you ought to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. You are not to do any kind of work on that day because it is Yom Kippur, to make atonement for you before Adonai your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day is to be cut off from his people. Continuing on. And anyone who does any kind of work on that day I will destroy from among his people. You are not to do any kind of work. It is a permanent regulation through all your generations, no matter where you live. It will be for you a Shabbat of complete rest, and you are to deny yourselves, and you are to rest on your Shabbat from evening, the ninth day of the month, which was sundown yesterday, until the following evening, which is sundown today. Now, just grabbing a few verses um, that I was told to grab. Leviticus 23, 26 through 27 says, I don't know, he said to Moshe, the tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. You were to have a holy convocation. You were to deny yourself, and you were to bring an offering made by fire to the Lord. Yom Kippur is a very special day. God only has um, a few days that we're to celebrate holy days on, which is where we get the word holiday from. Um, I know I repeat myself, but in India there are thousands and thousands and thousands of holy days, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Almost every day there's a feast to some God. Um, I think God made things very simple for us. He gave us one book, and he gave us seven feasts. It's not really hard to keep seven appointments especially 
for us today who seem to have appointments every day. Every day we seem to have some appointment regarding to work, labor, or leisure that we have to meet somebody. And God asks us to meet him seven times, which, as far as I'm concerned, is not overbearing by no means. And if you think these are Jewish holidays, then your thinking is off because it is clear that they're called the Lord's holidays. They're not Jewish holidays. Before they were Jews, there was the Lord. And he had these holidays before the foundation of the earth. So if you call yourself a Christian, that means you're grafted into the olive tree, not the Christmas tree. And if you're grafted into the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and this God has holidays, then by golly, you should celebrate them. Sure? Now it is. Um, I, could, I could preach on this till Yeshua returns, but the level of Christian pride and arrogance is so strong in the United States of America that they will not budge on their holidays. Their traditions are so much more important than pleasing God. And if you look at the Gospels, which I'm sure most Christians know the Gospels, the only time Yeshua was incredibly upset was when man had rules that abrogated the very laws and commandments of God. He had the hardest time with religious people, the pastors of his day, who were creating their man-made rules. What does God have to do to get you to put down your traditions? The, the window is closing, guys. I don't know if you know where you are on a timeline. I don't like to talk to my kids about this because my kids want to have a future, you know. They, they have grandiose dreams. And I don't want to take that away from them. But I also don't want them to be in the dark. This day is the holiest day on God's calendar. Make no mistake. Why is it so holy? Because the whole nation, the people of God, God's children in its entirety came before God and were forgiven as a nation. You know, if you think about it, I've been in a very Christian world for the last 18 years in Macon, Georgia. Macon, Georgia is very, very, very strongly Christian. And for 18 years, I have talked to pastors, and they've said they've worked so hard at trying to get a day, one day in the year, where they could have this national day of prayer and fasting. They've tried so hard. They've come up with these grandiose schemes. They've spent millions and millions of dollars on groups and speakers because they wanted America the Christians in America, to come before God on one day and repent and fast so they could be forgiven and America could be revived. We have that day. It's called Yom Kippur. And if a Christian could put down their silly... Thank you. It's not silly. It's arrogance. Arrogance. And they can embrace God's ways, then we would have a national day of prayer and fasting because as they're celebrating Yom Kippur and we wouldn't have to go around the Maypole and we wouldn't have to go down to City Hall, every single solitary Christian in every single solitary church today would be coming before God, begging his forgiveness. Yeah. 
And if you don't think revival would come after doing something like that, then you are not agreeing with what God promises. I'll give it a best shot, if I may. Thank you. Leviticus 23, 27 to 28 says, The tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. You want to have a holy convocation. You want to deny yourself. Now, am I solemn? I'm not trying to be solemn, guys. I don't set up my personality according to what day it is. My personality or my soul is controlled by the Spirit of God. Your soul, the seat of your emotions, your decision maker, should be so connected with God's Spirit that that Spirit should be controlling your decisions. I didn't wake up this morning and go, well, it's Yom Kippur, I think I'll be solemn. Or last week I gave kind of a hard message, so I think I'll give a goofy message. If you're conducting yourself like that, that in and of itself is goofy. Be controlled by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Be filled by the Spirit. Stop coming up with your ideas because you want to do something for God. If you want to do something for God, connect with His Spirit and do what He tells you. Let's look up this word, Kippur. It's Hebrew, of course. Yom is day. It's day of atonement. It's the day of atonement. But in many Hebrew words, there's a root word that is much more explanatory. So the root of this word, Kippur, is kafar, and it means to cover, to purge, to make reconciliation, to be merciful, and to atone for sin. What a magnificent, magnificent word. What a magnificent explanation and definition that God gives us. He wants to cover us. It's like there's a massive explosive ready to go off. And God says, I'll throw myself on it. I was a traditional Jew for 31 years. When I went to the synagogue on the Day of Atonement, I never got it. But there is no Jew today, whether they are secular, reformed, conservative, or even orthodox, is going to get it. Because you cannot celebrate the Day of Atonement without an atonement. In Leviticus 16, there were 34 verses that taught the Jewish people how God wanted them to celebrate an atonement. In Leviticus 17, 11, it says there's no remission of sin without blood. So today, in all the synagogues around the world, how can they be atoned for their sin? How can you celebrate Yom Kippur without a kippurah? At best, all they could do is memorialize something that happened Over 2,000 years ago, it's almost as if instead of somebody speaking the ironic benediction over them, they're speaking the ironic benediction over them. So my Gentile friends, stop being enamored with Judaism and be enamored with the king of Judaism. In God's economy, and if you belong to God, then you have to pay attention to his economy. The penalty for sin cannot be overlooked. It is either judged or forgiven. Atonement or forgiveness happens only when the sin is paid for. It has to be paid for but who can legitimately pay for all that sin 
so what does God do? He provides an innocent victim to be slaughtered as a substitute known in Jewish circles as a zobach. And he does this so his righteous judgment, not his judgment, his righteous judgment can be satisfied. When you think about it, it's absolutely magnificent. Justice satisfied, love uncompromised, this is our God. Leviticus 23.32 says, it will be for you a Shabbat. There's different kinds of Shabbat. There's a seven-day Shabbat, and then there's also your Yom Kippur Shabbat. A complete rest. You are to deny yourselves, and you are to rest on Shabbat from evening the ninth day until the month, until the following evening. The word deny is onah in Hebrew. And if you're wondering why we're looking at the Hebrew, I know some people have never been here because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. The word ana means to afflict, to humble, or to weaken. We take this to mean fasting. Now, there are people around the world, places like in South America, where they will actually put nails through their wrist and put themselves on a cross. This relates to fasting. All over the Bible, it speaks of fasting. Yeshua doesn't say, if you fast, it's when you fast. Fasting is an opportunity for each of us to personally observe Yom Kippur in a very personal way. It is a day of intense self-searching and earnest communication with the Almighty. This search requires an internal calm, which derives from slowing down our biological rhythm. On Yom Kippur, we seek reconciliation with God and humanity. Don't miss that part of it, kid. It's not just you asking God for forgiveness. Repentance requires us to stop and think. Before we get to these scriptures, I just want to give you a little background. In Second Chronicles, in chapters 3 through 5, King Solomon finished the temple of the Lord. And then in the next chapter, 2 Chronicles 6, he was dedicating the house in prayer. So let's pick things up at this point in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Verses 1 through 3, it says, When Shlomo, that Solomon, had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house so much so that the Kohanim, those of the priests, could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of Adonai filled Adonai's house. All the people of Israel saw when the fire came down and the glory of the Lord was on the house. They bowed down with their faces to the ground on the flooring, prostrating themselves, and they gave thanks to Adonai and said, he is good. Now we throw this word good around, not just in secular circles, but worst case, in Christian circles. That service was good. That, that was good. I thought it was pretty good. Can you imagine why they're using this word good? Because fire came down from heaven and consumed the thousands and thousands of sacrifices. Can you imagine seeing that? And the Lord's presence, his spirit, filled. There was no room for anybody to get into the temple. And that's when they said, that's good. Do you see the difference? 
Guys, be very careful with your choice of words. Don't abuse your words. The temple of the Lord was complete here. The house is dedicated, which is appropriate. We did the same thing here. We were told to build the temple. We did. It went against my grain. It went against Bernadette's grain. We did all we could to deny it until God put his foot on my throat. We dedicated this house to the Lord. We called it what God wanted us to call it. This is Yeshua's house. We built it according to his standard. And God displayed back then his absolute acceptance with incredible manifestation of his presence that has never been duplicated. Moving on to verses 8 through 9, it says, So Shlomo Solomon celebrated the festival at that time for seven days. What festival? He didn't make up a festival. It's a Moadim that he's referring to. We'll find out. Because God's not, never going to put us in the dark. We put ourselves in the dark. Together with all Israel, an enormous gathering. They had come all the way from the entrance of Hamat. Hamat was 132 miles north of Damascus. All the way to the Vadi of Egypt. This includes all of Solomon's kingdom. Everybody came. Everybody was there. On the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly. This is, what eighth day? What do we know about the, what eighth day celebration is there? It's the end of Sukkot. The eighth day, it tells us in a couple of sentences, and on the 23rd day, when that was over, he sent them home. It says they observed the dedication for seven days. They had a seven-day dedication of the building, and then the festival for seven days. So it started on the 9th, which means this whole time they were in the temple, it encompassed Yom Kippur. They celebrated Yom Kippur. What a great time. What a coincidence, what a coinky dinky that God had them finish the temple for them to all come before God and beg for his forgiveness. Nothing God does is haphazard. Everything he does, and I mean everything, it's very specific about his timing. Our problem is we don't align with his timing. So we get out of step and we do things according to our schedule and expect God to bless it, but God is not going to follow our schedule. We're to follow his schedule. Verse 12, it says, Adonai appeared to Shlomo by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So they had a dedication for the temple. Then they celebrated the feast, which included Yom Kippur and Sukkot and the eighth day. And then he sends the people home. Let me ask you something. You've probably read this or heard this, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Oh, I don't know, 75,000 times, give or take. Let me just ask you guys. You've read it a thousand times. So He has this dedication, he finishes the temple, he has the dedication, and then they're celebrating the festival, and it's over, so he sends him home, and then he goes to his residence, and God visits him. How much time do you think transpired between the time he sent them home and the time God visited him? What would you say? Yeah, and how do you know that? Because I told you. But nobody knows that, right? What does everybody think? He sent them home and then went to sleep and God visited them. Because you don't read. You spend so much time on nonsense. 
you'll search for three hours the web to save three bucks on a pair of sneakers, but you wouldn't give God the time of day. And some of you have been with me 18 years, and I've begged you and begged you and begged you, begged you and begged you and begged you. And you go back for a week, and right back in the muck and mire, and you wonder why. I have no peace. I'm not hearing from God. I don't understand what's going on. And you think it's his fault. Look at the verse before, 2 Chronicles 7, 11. Shlomo finished the house of Adonai and the royal palace. So he also built himself a palace. You know what the sad part is? Solomon's palace was twice the size of God's temple. I've had a couple of people over the years come to me in Bernadette and say, why are you building such an elaborate place? Why do you live in such an elaborate place? Rabbi, it cost a million dollars. You could have put it together something for 400000 and gave 600000 to the poor. Okay, does anybody here live in a house? Could any of you possibly live in a smaller house and give that money to the poor? Be careful what you say. Because God has something called severe mercy. Every single person in this place could downsize. Every single person in this place can drive an older car. Every single person in this place could give more money away. I did what God told us to do. Make sure you're doing what God's told you to do. Do you know what took Shlomo longer to build his palace than it did the temple? Maybe that's why things started to fall apart for old Solomon. Everything that Shlomo had set his heart on making in the house of Adonai and in his own palace, he accomplished successfully. If you want to know where we get the 13 years from, kiddo, just go to 1 Kings 7.1, you'll find out. Going back to 7.12 now, Adonai appears to Shlomo by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer. How incredibly intimate is that? He's taken over for his father, who is called a man after God's own heart. And now God directs his attention to Solomon. He said, I have chosen. I told you to build this. It wasn't his idea. I told you to build this temple because I wanted a place for myself as a house of sacrifice. The temple is for sacrifice as well as prayer. The Old Testament understanding of worship regularly joins sacrifices with prayer as a material expression of the worshiper's inner disposition. Love is sacrifice, make no mistake. And the greater the sacrifice, the greater the love. And I know there might be some English majors here, so forgive me, but if it don't cost nothing, it ain't worth nothing. Now we get into the meat of it, Second Chronicles 7.13 the Lord says, if I shut up the sky so that there is no rain, or if I order locusts to devour the land, or if I send an epidemic, don't you know what's going on with COVID? You conspiracy nuts blaming China. God's in control, not China. Twenty-five years, I begged America to bless the Lord. And 25 years, she told me, no, thank you. We had two incredible chances. September 11, 2001, we had a chance to cry out to God. And instead, we arrogantly pointed our finger in God's face and said, we will rebuild it better. We're America. We paid no heed. And then the epidemic hit, and what did we say? We'll find a cure. 
Guys, the window of opportunity is closing very fast. We don't have a lot of time. No, a seal hasn't been broken yet. Read your Bible. When that first seal is broken, it is obvious that nations have come together, warring nations. And then that next seal, it's a chain of events. It's a domino effect. They will declare war, and there will be famine, and then death will follow one-fourth of the earth. This is a summary reference to the divine punishments mentioned in Solomon's prayer. We thought we can get away with it. But that's not the way it works. God has been so good to this country like no other country. It was founded by God-fearing principles. It was a country that was supposed to be a western wall to Israel. That's history. This country is an enemy to Israel. And becoming an enemy to Israel is becoming an enemy to God. You poke Israel in the eye, you're poking God in the eye. Next verse says it all. This is the recipe. There is no other recipe. Now, do I think America is going to whip this up and make a revival cake? No. Rabbi, that's negative. I am telling you what God told me. And I've been saying it for 25 years. If my people who bear my name, those are believers, not the world, will humble themselves. That's a big if. If they'll just humble themselves. And then pray. Seek me. And turn. Not just say you're sorry. Turn. I promise I'll heal you. I'll heal you. I'll forgive you. I'll heal you. This great verse expresses, as done none other in Scripture, God's requirement for national blessing. Whether it's in Solomon's time or in Ezra's time or our own time, Those who believe must first forsake their sins, turn from the life that is centered in self, and yield to God's word and God's will. Then and only then will heaven send revival. Revival is is amazing. It's renewed, fervent devotion to follow God. It's an intense passion with one's whole heart, even in the midst of opposition. Revival is when God comes and reveals himself in awesome holiness and irresistible power. It is when the Lord visits the world of men to impart a fresh vision of his glory and his grace while simultaneously revealing man's sinfulness and inadequacy and desperate need of his mercy. There was a man you may know called Count Zinzendorf. He lived from 1700 to 1760. He was a German religious and social reformer and bishop of the Moravian Church, one of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world, dating back to the Bohemian Reformation of the 15th century. The Moravians focused on three things, three things and three things only. One, unity. How many times have I preached unity here? And you have your little nuances that you don't like, and that's what you focus on. I hope you know that when you focus on those nuances, you're making God focus on your nuances. Look how fragile a snowflake is. It melts the minute it hits your hand. 
But when snowflakes come together, they stop traffic. We've worked so hard here to create a unified spirit. Why are you looking at things so pharisaical? Some of you who I love, I love, I love. And you're caught up in these nuances. Like any of us have a corner on the market on holiness. Unity, personal piety, being holy, thinking holy, and missions. Those are the things they focused on, unity and piety and missions. you got to get out of yourself. During the time of great revival, this is what Zinzendorf said, and I quote, Everyone desired above everything else that the Holy Spirit might have full control. Imagine. Self-love and self-will. Do we have an interpretation for that? I'm sorry, according to the Bible, I can't receive that. Then just say amen. Good boy. Self-love, self-will, as well as all disobedience, disappeared. Self-will and self-love, as well as all disobedience, disappeared. And an overwhelming flood of grace swept us all out into the great ocean of divine love. People in traditional Judaism on Yom Kippur wear white. I always wear white because I try to be traditional. And God said, do not wear white today. Wear black and white. Because we are at a major crossroads, guys. Today we're at a crossroad. And we have to choose today. There is no eating. There is no drinking. There is no perfuming. And there is no deodorizing. You look around the synagogue at 4 in the afternoon. I was telling my kids last night. We would go to the synagogue on Friday night for hours and hours and hours and then go home at midnight and come back in the morning at 7 in the morning and stay there all day. And you look around at 4 in the afternoon and you're looking at dressed up corpses. It's almost like they're dead. Why? Because Yom Kippur is the day of death. Death of the old year. Death of the old ego, death of the old sins, is the day of death so there could be new life. God's calendar is perfect. He blows the shofar to wake us up and regather us. Come on, come on. And then we all come before him. Do you want to tell me anything, God says? And we collectively say, we're sorry. And then Sukkot comes and his presence comes into our tabernacle. On Yom Kippur, we are given a second chance. A clean slate, if you will. I think we desperately need to consider the offer for revival on Yom Kippur. Now the Machsor, which means life cycle, different than the Siddur, which means prayer book. There's a hundred prayers in there. And I don't believe in just praying for the sake of praying. But there's a couple of prayers I'd like you to join me in. So if you would stand. If you can't stand because of some physical ailment, by all means, sit. But this is called the Ashamnu. There should be some um, machsors around. It's on page 204. And in the English, it means we have sinned. And if you'll read this with me. We have trespassed, we have dealt deceitfully, we have stolen, and we have slandered. We have acted perversely, we have done wrong, we have acted presumptuously, and we have been violent. We have spoken lies, we have counseled evil, we have spoken falsely, and we have blasphemed. We have scoffed, we have rebelled, we have provoked, and we have oppressed. We have been stiff-necked, we have corrupted, 
We have gone astray and we have led others astray. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. The Moad prayer is the prayer for the Moad, and it's on page 206, and if you'd recite this with me, I'd appreciate it. If you don't feel comfortable, by no means don't feel obligated. Our God and God of our fathers, you have given us this day as a time to examine and judge ourselves, to joyfully bring harvest offerings to you, and to look forward to Messiah's return. We remember Yeshua, our great high priest, who brought his own precious blood, the blood of atonement, into your most holy place. Through his blood, which cleanses us from sin, we now have our consciences purified from guilt and condemnation, and can serve you in love with pure devotion. Amen. You will bring this age to a close with a shofar call heralding a new age. Then nations shall learn war no more. The lion and the lamb shall lay down together in peace, and your name shall be won over all the earth. In that day Israel shall be delivered and dwell in peace, and all the nations shall come to your light. The new Jerusalem and the new temple will be established with priests and Levites from among all peoples, and from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, and on the appointed season of Sukkot, all flesh shall come to worship before you. Amen. You may be seated. With that being said, we can also experience a personal Yom Kippur on an as-needed basis. This is a day we come together, but we don't have to wait for this day to come before the Lord. As new covenant believers, which we are, we are new covenant believers we can be revived daily if we so choose. Because of what Yeshua did at Golgotha, we can come before God and humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways and come back to a close, intimate relationship with God over and over and over and over again. One last thing I want you to see because I do want to encourage you a bit and God gave me a green light. Look at 1 John 1. 8 through 9 and 2, 1. Can I, please? Thanks. Appreciate it. Let me turn this off, otherwise they'll think it's Yom Teruah. It says here from the disciple who was closest to Yeshua, it says, if we claim not to have sin, we're deceiving ourselves. There's a difference, guys, between sins and sin. The Bible talks about sins and it talks about sin. Sin is our nature, which is going to be with us until we go or he comes. But we don't have to let that nature run wild. If we say we're not, we have no sin, the truth isn't in us. That means Messiah isn't in us. But if we acknowledge our sins, then since he is trustworthy and just, you could depend on his promises. He says he'll forgive them and purify us. He says, my children, I'm writing you these things so that you won't sin. He's not saying sin as little as you can. He's not saying that. He's saying, I'm hoping that your sins aren't big. He's saying, I don't want you to sin. When you look at your shoe on the cross, it, it speaks two things, just two things. God's crazy about you, but your sin is horrific. There are people sitting right here who will never recover, never be whole until your shoe comes because of sins that were perpetrated against them by some people who were supposed to be close to them and who were supposed to love them and care for them. But if anyone does sin, if you do, not when, but if, don't start off your day in the block and go, well, I'm going to fail. I'm not going to run well, so I'm just going to tell you right now, forgive me up front. I'm just going to do my thing. 
That's crazy way to run this race. But if anyone does, we have a tzaddik. We don't have to wait for the temple to be rebuilt and bring in our goats and our bulls and our rams. We have a tzaddik, only one. Not Schneerson, not Spurgeon, all sinners. And for any Catholics, not Mary, she was a sinner. Every single solitary human being that has ever been birthed from Adam has been born into sin. And he pleads our cause with the Father. Pleads. You want to talk about an advocate? You want to talk about a defense attorney? What better to have a defense attorney who's one with the judge? The things I want you to see, though, is he says, my children. Doesn't say my people. Doesn't say, hey, you guys. Do you see it? Miraculously, it was italicized. My children. He's referring to us as his children. Therefore, the forgiveness here, the forgiveness is parental, not judicial. When you were born again, you can't be judged. It has to do with our fellowship with God and not with our relationship. This is why the scripture says we have a tzaddik. Not with God, but with the Father. It could have said we have a tzaddik with God. These words were chosen by God with the Father. God is still our Father. Even if we sin, when a person is born again, he becomes a child of God. God becomes his father. Nothing could change that. When Max was born to me, I'm his father. And a birth is something that can't be undone. I spent my believing life being on probation. Constantly at night, did I do it right, God? Like when Max was little and he'd be up at bat, he'd look at me. Dad, I'm trying my best. That's why I live my believing life. Up and bad every day. Did I do it right, God? Did I do enough today, God? Did I witness enough? Did I, did I send enough to missions? Did I talk to enough people? Did I apologize enough? It's no way to live. If you're born again, then you're secure. You can't be unborn. Last but not least, it should blow us away that we have a tzaddik, a righteous defender. When Satan brings some accusation against us, Messiah Yeshua can point to his finished work of God and say, Father, charge my account. You have an opportunity today if you've never taken it. You know me, this is not a show. And if you think it is a show, then it's his show, not mine and not yours. You have an opportunity to take all your sins, and Yeshua is right here, and take those sins and put your hands right on his head and transfer those sins to him. His word is true, and it is faithful, and he promises to take those sins. And you could be born from above today, today. Your slate can be clean, and you can be connected to God forever and ever. And all you have to do is just humble yourself. I don't understand people. Do you think God's lying? Do you think I wasn't born again? You know, my testimony is, I was crazy. You don't even know what crazy is. You've never met somebody who partied as much as me. Never. I'm not proud of it. And at my wedding, when my 12 ushers came up to me, 
And one by one during the wedding at this castle, they said, how are you going to pull this off? You know what they asked me? How is this ever going to work out? You're not marriage material. It's, it won't work. It can't work. And you know what my answer was? I don't know. I don't know. But then I got saved, and it's 32 years, and it worked out. And it didn't just work out okay, guys. Listen, for some of you young guns, let me tell you, it didn't just work out okay. We had so much crap in our life that had to be carved out that there was no hope for our wedding. There was no hope for our marriage. And I would get on my hands and knees at night and beg God, let me have a good marriage. I was crazy, and I was so blessed, and now I've given you my life. Why? I'm telling you that he gave us a marriage today better than I ever prayed for, better than I would have ever thought. Because when you stay the course, and you stay faithful, and you stay penitent, God's blessings will rain down. It's a promise. I asked Darren to come up and to play about 15 minutes of just some instrumental music. I would ask you on Yom Kippur to, after the benediction, to, to, to leave the sanctuary and let people do business with God in this holy place today. I would also say that the wall is a great place. God manifests his presence there on a regular basis. So I'm not pushing you out. There's plenty of places to go outside, and Michamoch and this, but... Let this be a solemn time for people who feel the need to stay a while and spend some time with God. Although he might finish up at 15 minutes, you could stay longer, okay? So I'll ask you all to stand together with me as we bring this to a close. And we will see each other in just a couple of days. If you'll grab the hand of somebody next to you, if you're not comfortable with that, you don't have to. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Blessings, guys.